afternoon. Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Susan Aronson, and I direct the Digital Trade and Data Governance Hub. And I'd like to welcome you to Profits Built on Personal Data. And so I'd like to begin by thanking our co-organizers at GW and outside of GW, CG, the Institute for International Economic Policy, the Internet Society of Washington, Washington DC. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Natalie Marichal, who's the Senior Policy and Partnership Manager at Ranking Digital Rights. Chris Riley, the Senior Fellow at the R Street Institute. Sean McDonald, who's the co-founder of Digital Public and the CEO of Frontline SMS. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna ask them a couple of questions as with our usual webinars. And uh, then we will leave at least a half an hour for you to ask them questions. So welcome and here we go. Good morning, Natalie, or good afternoon, I guess. <laughs> Could you please describe the business model underpinning many of the large platforms? And what are the possible spillovers? What does it mean for human rights and human autonomy? Absolutely, Susan, and thanks so much for having me here today. Um, looking forward to the conversation with, with Chris and, and Sean and, uh, and, and you and, and the rest of, of everyone who's here. Um, so there's a lot of talk these days about how it's the business model. And uh, I should take some blame for that because uh, we, you know, my organization published um, a, a report series back in 2020 if, uh, you know, uh, saying that it's the business model, right? And encouraging policymakers to uh, stop trying to regulate content directly, um, both because that's unconstitutional and um, because it wouldn't actually work. Uh, and to instead think about uh, the uh, incentive structures um, that are created by the financial imperatives of social media and, and big tech more broadly uh, business model uh, that's centered on uh, targeted advertising, uh, also known as uh, uh, also known as surveillance advertising, programmatic advertising. There's a bunch of different words that mean roughly the same thing, at least for for our purposes here today. But what is this business model? Uh, that's something that I think uh, can use uh, a bit more elucidating. So, so I hope to spend the first few minutes here today uh, bring some clarity to, to this question. So in my, my, the title that I had there, you know, the business model is the message, is obviously a reference to a Canadian media scholar, Marshall McLuhan, uh, who said that the medium is the message, right? And what he meant by that is that when you look at a, a media text, it's whether that's uh, the written word or television or radio or the or a website or social media, the 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 content, the, the words and the image that you're looking at are not the only thing that's relevant. You also have to look at the technology itself and at the uh, socio-technical infrastructure, including the company that produces the technology, the human beings who together form the company, everything around that uh, to, under, to really understand uh, how that message came into being and what its impact might be on society. And so that's what I wanna do with, uh, with this analysis of the social media business model today. So this chart is a lot. I tried to make it simpler, couldn't do it. Um, maybe maybe, with, maybe one of my colleagues uh, at, at our ranking digital rights can help me iterate on this to make it a little bit uh, less uh, visually violent uh, than, than it is right now. Um, but I think the, I think the content is, 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 is where I need it to be. So you can see here that we have a set of boxes that are uh, on a pinkish background that look at you know the user content, which is what most of us when we're having policy conversations or conversations with our friends and family about social media are really focused on. But that's really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, alongside it, we also have the advertising content, which is where the real money is. And I'll come back to that uh, in a second. But the user content is the result of a whole series of processes uh, and, and infrastructural um, and socio-infrastructural systems uh, that build on each other, right? From at the very bottom, the bedrock is these financial and economic incentives that are created by uh, the surveillance advertising business model. The corporate governance, how the human beings who constitute a company make decisions, right? Um, 
human decision making, making a big deal of that being there because it's throughout. And a lot of times the conversation about tech tends to default to like, oh, well, it's tech. So it's just automatic. There's no, this is just the way that it is. It's kind of this, um, we kind of have to take this fatalistic attitude to uh, there's nothing ca that can be done about it. But that's simply not true, right? Tech is a reflection of uh, human decision making. Uh, and we can change those decisions and change the tech and change the, the impact. Um, that includes first and foremost, the recommendation algorithms, uh, but also the user content rules, uh, the, uh, the algorithmic systems that detect violative content, uh, the, pro the, the processes, both human and automated, that address the violative content. Um, and from there, you get the user content. But of course, very similar dynamics are at play uh, in advertising. Uh, and here again, the advertising is where the money comes from, right? So the, the incentives um, stem from the, the, the market forces behind uh, the, the, ad, the ad tech sector. And so the conver the public conversa conversation, uh, especially around policy, tends to really only focus on this uh, red uh, maroonish part of the chart. What I want to do is talk about the parts of the chart that have a great background. So the financial and economic incentives, the corporate governance, much of the human decision making, and that entire entire advertising vertical. What are the advertising rules for both um, targeting and for uh, content. Uh, who gets, who sets those targeting parameters? To what extent is it the advertiser versus the platform optimizing on its own? Who's checking on the impact of that? Um, how do, how do advert ads end up uh, in front of, in front of our eyes? And how does that affect uh, the public conversation, public debate, the public sphere? Uh, how does that affect society? Um, so as far as, you know, so drawing connections between uh, this, this structure and the exact, how exactly this leads to impacts on society, and I'm not going to describe those impacts, you know, we have hate speech, we have incitement to violence, we have uh, organized, um, organized terrorism, we have uh, harm to children, we have bullying, we have all kinds of things. I think everyone's familiar with the wide range of, of harms uh, that, that occur um, through social media platforms. So I'm, I'm not going to dwell on those. Um, but where, what's the connection between that and the business model? So starting from what was the bottom in the previous slide and is now the top, the incentive is to maximize targeted ad revenue. So how do we do that if we're, if we're a social media company? You have to grow your user base as much as possible. You have to establish market dominance. You don't want competitors, right? Because uh, there's network effects in the social media market where you know you can't have, you want to dominate. Um, you have to increase your average revenue per, per user. You want as many users as possible and you want each of those users to be as lucrative as possible. To do that, you need to increase engagement. You need to increase your surveillance of both your users and other internet users in order to uh, use algorithms to um, manipulate their behavior to get them to do what you want, which is to click on ads so that you can tell your advertisers that they're getting a lot of revenue, they're getting a lot of return on investment from their ads, so you can charge more money for their ads. You want to avoid bad PR, right? You want to avoid regulation. Um, to do all this, you need to maintain tight control over corporate decisions. Uh, a few of the ways that this happens is uh, the dual the, the, the duality, the dual role of CEO and chair of the board, right? Mark Zuckerberg is a prime example of that, but there are others in the tech sector and, and beyond. The multi-class stock structure, here again, Facebook, really clear example, but Google also has this. A number of other tech companies have this. This means that shareholders uh, are powerless to uh, force changes at, um, at the top of the company, uh, which is how corporate governance is supposed to work. Um, it also means that content moderation decisions are influenced by lobbying priorities, right? I think we all know lots of examples of that. Again, Facebook, shining example of what not to do uh, in, in this area. Well, not, not, not to do from the public interest, from the, percep from the perspective of growing your revenue, great example of what to do. Um, so what do platforms do? Um, they, as far as content moderation. So it, all of these intensives mean that you want to manage negative externalities. So those are all the content harms that, that we've mentioned uh, through content moderation. But it's impossible to do this perfectly at speed, uh, at scale and at cost. Uh, there will never be a time when it is possible to do that, never, right? So forget about the idea that perfect content moderation is just around the corner. That is never going to happen. So you have to triage. 
So how do you triage? You triage in ways that line up with, again, your financial interests. So that means that you're going to prioritize certain key constituencies and certain markets to put your Como resources into that. That creates huge questions of language equity. There's going to be a bias for automation because once you have the, uh, the, the ML models trained, it's a lot cheaper to run those than to hire a whole bunch of people around the world fluent on a whole bunch of different languages who have you know, pesky needs like you know, they get mental health uh, issues, they get PTSD when you want, make them watch too many beheading videos, right? Um, because of uh, the, the, the dominance factor and, and, and various other factors that, that I think you're, you're familiar with, there's, a, there's American cultural hegemony built into the entire system there. That's very problematic, but it's not something that's addressed. Um, C platforms often outsource their customer service to, to CSOs. Um, you know, anyone who works in, uh, in my field is used to getting uh, signal messages in the middle of the night from colleagues in, in various parts of the world saying, hey, um, my government just ordered like all NGO, all activist uh, accounts on Twitter, on Facebook, wherever to be, uh, to be shut down, can't get a hold of, this is clearly political rep retribution for our activism, can't figure out uh, what to do about it. Can you put me in touch with someone at Facebook? And you know, we do our best to work uh, our connections to get them in touch with the right person. That's not our job, right? That's that's an that's a, a cost that uh, that that platforms are uh, externalizing onto uh, civil society. Uh, and in the case of Facebook, they also have the Facebook Oversight Board, which they to which they can pass the buck for making really tough decisions and, and give them this, this veneer of, uh, of accountability and, and, and responsiveness to, to some outside force. Meanwhile, they're actual, the, the, the entity that Facebook leadership is actually supposed to be uh, accountable to, its board of directors, um, is pretty much completely beholden to, uh, to, to Zuckerberg and, and Sandberg and, and a couple other uh, top leaders. Um, so as far as platforms are concerned, we can keep playing harmful content whack-a-mole forever, right? And they're making lots of money, so they're happy. But, you know, again, relying on content moderation, whether it's human or machine, is to address all these content harms is like using a pipette to take pollution out of a river, right? It's 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 not going to work. It's not going to work. It's just not going to cause a lot of work and uh, and and it's not going to do any good. So instead, we should focus our efforts at the source, um, at the at the business model, and at the incentive structure uh, that it creates. Um, now I'll turn it over to Chris to tell us more about whether and how that's happening. Thank you, Chris. Um, if you could also talk about what are some of the corporate efforts to change that models and and how useful. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, Sean, for joining as well. Uh, first, I want to convey my appreciation for where this conversation has gone over the past couple of years. As Natalie noted, we've really shifted the focus of it from the content to the business model, which I think is a, a good step forward. Uh, there's a nuance here, which is we have sort of a dual focus emerging on the tech, which is also a good thing, I would argue, with parallel public policy conversations around the role of automation, machine learning through recommendations and so forth. In general, I see this development as a good thing. Regardless of disagreements we may have about what the right, better version of the future is and how we get there, an improvement to the baseline of understanding is a good step. And business model and tech really matter here more than specific pieces of content and the obsession that that can drive. Speaking of good things, and to Susan's point, I do see some good steps within the market, good things happening that can present people with different kinds of business model choices. I talk about DuckDuckGo in particular a fair bit because I think the company has really made an impact on the market by leaning in on privacy as its differentiation. Now it still uses advertising, but DuckDuckGo's is contextual and keyword based, which I believe has been shown by some academic work to be nearly as effective as the kinds of heavily personalized, heavily targeted advertising in a lot of commercial contexts, not all, but in a lot of them. Um, there are some other interesting companies that you know of that use business models that are not predicated on personal profiles, constant tracking and profiling and so forth. Reddit is another good example, right? It's nice to see experiments in the market with different business models. Obviously big in the news today is uh, Google's uh, uh, rollout of the Topics API as a, as a replacement for Flock, their earlier effort, Federated Lines of, uh, I forget what Flock stands for, but I'm sure a lot of people in the audience here have read about this. Um, when Flock originally came out, 
I felt like it was imperfect, but I nevertheless really appreciated the directionality of it. This has all been an effort to roll out third-party cookies, which technically have been one of the mechanisms by which users are tracked and followed around the internet, by which extensive profiles are built. So there is a shift that's happening in the, in the tech here that can result in some amount of greater first-party advantage compared to third parties. That was a lot of the criticism that Google got when Flock came out. I recognize that, but to me, it, it doesn't outweigh the good that comes from continuing to phase out third-party cookies. So topics is the thing of the day. It feels like a marked improvement over Flock to me. I've been reading a little bit of the pol policy commentary, a little of the technical commentary. I feel like the privacy balance is getting to a decent place there. Client-side customization is a really nice piece of this. There are, I'm sure, some tweaks that can be made to make it even harder for third parties to inform. Anyway, I'm getting way down in the rabbit, the rabbit uh, hole here of this, but I just wanted to sort of surface this as a thing that we see. Now, one of the questions I have is that Topics API is being offered in Chrome, and if it really takes off, what does that mean for my former employers at Mozilla and the Firefox web browser? If it's a well-documented API that's being rolled out, Google's probably not going to put up a big fight if somebody else comes along and essentially copies the API, because after all, Google just won a Supreme Court case last year saying that copying APIs is fair use, the work will be Google case. So I think there's a really interesting potential future ahead where people can sort of recreate topics API and we can see some more market experimentation in the space from a bunch of different companies. Really looking forward to watching that. I started with the good, let's talk about the bad. I don't think these examples that I'm seeing are really going to transform the status quo that many people find so dissatisfying. People feel trapped into a specific business model. People feel like their only choice is to accept it or for example, to stop using Facebook altogether. I think that perceived lot, lack of user agency is a powerful motivating force between a lot of the discontent that we're seeing with tech right now. And I think the consequences are broader than just privacy. I think that's driving reform conversations around section 230, obviously, also, I would say around competition and, 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 a, and a number of other things. We feel trapped and we need to figure out what the better version of the internet looks like and what the roadmap is to get there. I'm not gonna stake out a position on specific laws, not the surveillance uh, uh, bill that was just introduced, the surveillance ads bill in Congress, nor the targeted advertising provisions in the Digital Services Act that the European Parliament just voted on. I will say there are some good pieces of these that I really like. I like seeing the focus on data brokers I like seeing the focus on sensitive criteria and categories and targeting. I like seeing the focus on dark patterns. I see a lot of really good steps, things that really make sense for government to be looking at intervening with. But in my opinion, those are still around the margins and don't really set out what the future of the internet looks like. So people are going to continue calling for an end to surveillance advertising. I think if we could stop surveillance advertising today, somebody would pull the lever on that and the internet economy would collapse. We're not ready for that. And frankly, I don't think that is necessarily the vision we should be pushing for. I think to imagine government agencies coming in and saying, you should not have this business model entirely is paternalistic. And that the real future that we need to present is one that has meaningful options for business choice. Now, business model choice, excuse me. The, I'm not re, redefending the Hobson's choice of notice and choice, that old paradigm that never really worked. But I'm saying we need to think about business model choice and how we can use that and, and leverage market forces to really lead to better outcomes here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sean? So you have a very different take. And in fact, you've argued that, quote unquote, more important than how a platform company structures itself is how that structure defines user rights and corporate accountability. Okay, you think a key issue is that they have this structure because they want to avoid liability. So go for it. Well, I, feel, I mean, you've done the heavy lifting, Susan. No, I, I think, uh, thank you. And you know, thank you to Natalie and Chris for uh, letting, letting me participate in this conversation as well. I think you know, to Natalie's point and, and to her, um, some of her graphics, you know, a lot of what we talk about are individual business practices. And to marry sort of Natalie and Chris's point, we can't, we can't do this piece of content by content. We can't do this business practice by business practice, really. And in particular, I th there are a couple of shifts that I think are really important to note about how this ecosystem actually works. So really quickly, um, my background is that I, I run an organization called Frontline SMS, which built 
what is now colloquially called public interest tech. Back when we started, it was information communication technology for development. Uh, we should tell you exactly how old we are to a certain kind of nerd. Uh, but the point is, is that we were out trying to build international tech and we never did surveillance advertising. Um, we, we in fact never advertised at all. We were always built on a direct service model. Um, but even with our best efforts to act as a, as a tech company and to have a sort of specific and linear business model, there were a number of ecosystem pressures that played a really determinative role in the way that we were, you know, in the way that we impacted people's digital rights. And so um, I think it's extremely important for us to be thinking about not just kind of individual actors, how do you get Facebook, I mean, Meta, Google, I mean, Alphabet, you know, these organizations that are already unbundling into parent companies that, you know, to show you how difficult a lot of these sort of rights issues are going to be in practice, to be thinking about them as supply chains, right? That, that we are all building on infrastructure, some of which is shared, much of which is privately owned. <clears throat> and it's not to suggest that there aren't important business models to Chris's point. I think that we're, you know, still in a broad experimentation phase, but I think that, you know, to, to, to speak to the rights implications of this, we're building a standards-based economy without a, without a credible sort of underpinning justice mechanism. And that's not really how it, how it has worked historically in most places. We have standards, but then we have court systems or a number of sort of quasi-legal structures and processes that help adapt and interpret those standards and context toward ensuring that we protect people's local rights, political rights, agency rights, all of which, as Natalie says, are con deeply contextual and don't really work out even in a very well-trained uh, machine learning model. And so one example of this, obviously from the ads ecosystem, is a newspaper, you have a whole bunch of secondary trackers. You know, a lot of times you even have organizations trying to do the right thing in terms of having subscription-based business models, but the ecosystem of data tracking and intermediation means that a lot of the behaviors that we're talking about trying to prevent persist. And to Chris's point about this being bigger than just ads, uh, you know, one example from Frontline's experience is some of you may know of an organization called Twilio. They're a great company. They essentially resell text message and mobile phone services, but do it over API. So if you're running a software platform, you can essentially very quickly register for a phone number for your company or your business and, and run certain types of automation in their system. They have compliance relationships with the telecom carriers that they work with. And all of those telecoms have direct compliance requirements from the government to do things like prevent and filter spamming. And so one of the things that you'll notice if you're ever sort of interacting with someone via text message or like a business or a company, if you text stop, it full on stops the conversation. Not only that, but Twilio essentially takes your number out of their contact database or prevents you from reaching out to them in future. And on the one hand, that might feel like a really pro-consumer thing. And in a lot of cases it is, I certainly use it very frequently. And on the other, if you're an organization with stop in the name, then you lose database subscribers very quickly, right? And so there are all kinds of ways in which our, even our use of language in very common platforms get affected by these sort of supply chain compliance relationships that get exercised. And those are just, you know, little examples. We've seen copyright intermediation become a huge thing, content and copyright filters. Obviously content moderation is, is a big issue as, as Natalie raised. I think to, to the, the, the thing that I would sort of wrap up with or, or offer back to as, as suggestions and as Susan sort of um, didn't issue a spoiler alert for is that, <laughs> sorry, I only have so much material, is that I think in a lot of instances where we struggle now in much of the digital rights sort of advocacy and realization space of whatever frame of rights is one establishing, you know, what you'd call a problem owner in law, you'd call them a duty holder. But essentially, when you have these big and varied supply chains where everybody's making a tiny bit of the decision or exerting a tiny bit of the agency and re realizing a relatively tiny bit of the value per transaction, it can be extremely difficult to say, okay, here's how we group this whole, whole line together and hold them accountable for the impacts of their behavior. And then secondarily, 
you know, I just would draw a, a bright line under this idea of how we institutionally access justice. I think we talk a lot about the role of regulators and we talk a lot about the fallacies of industry self-regulation, but we very often sort of neglect direct rights of action, which is how do I as a person who has been directly harmed go about seeking redress or enforcing my rights, especially in places where the legal system doesn't necessarily have obvious jurisdiction over the companies or the, the, the problem giving rise to the harm. So I'll stop there, but I just I, I would just encourage us to be, when we're thinking about these, these different levels of the problem, also bearing in mind how, you know, the basic mechanisms of how we participate in them. Let me underscore that point you just made about jurisdiction, because I want to understand that better myself more over time. I think that is one of, it's going to be a key issue for data governance. Um, guys, please, uh, we really want to hear from you. So please put your questions in the q and I'll ask um, one or two more questions, but we really want to hear from you. So please put them in the Q&A. Okay, so you gave us a sense, Sean, and thank you, of what, how we might uh, govern data in an accountable manner. Nat Natalie, do you want to add anything? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Sean, Sean made the point that even uh, companies that want to do the right thing and uh, respect the privacy of their users and, and everyone else on the web and in the world uh, can't, you know, it's really hard for them to do that and compete against uh, companies that that don't, right? And so you end up in a, in this unregulated space or at least underregulated space. You end up with uh, with what I would call a race to the bottom. And that's the sort of situation, uh, the sort of market failure for which uh, regulation is is really the remedy, right? So, so I do support uh, the the Banning Surveillance Advertising Act. Um, my colleagues and I also just yesterday uh, filed a comment to the FTC uh, supporting accountable text uh, petition for rulemaking. Um, you know. I, I wish the DSA uh, in Europe had gone farther, um, but you know the the regulation that's that's in that in that bill um, is is certainly preferable to the status quo. So I, I will be very happy if um, if the DSA as as currently written uh, is 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 made in, into law. Um, but you know we, we're talking about governing data, so it's not just about data; it's also about governing. And I think it's just as important to uh, to make some some real changes to uh, corporate governance uh, gov uh, to corporate governance in the US, well, we're talking in the US and mostly of the US. Um, you know, the first thing would be uh, to phase out uh, the, the dual role of, uh, of CEOs and, um, and, and chairman of, of the board of directors, right? Those should be two different roles. Otherwise, the CEO is just accountable to, to him or herself, right? That's that's not accountability. That's, that's something else. Um, the second thing is to phase out uh, dual class or multi-class stock structures, um, and there there is a discussion draft. Uh, I believe that uh, that Representative Waters's office has. I'm not sure what's happening to it, but I would love to see that bill um, get get introduced and um, and move into uh, into committee and 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 be voted into law. Uh, I, there's also um, a lot of discussion in. Um, in the ESG uh, space about um, mandating uh, certain types of due diligence uh, for different types of, of products and services. And I think that's that's a really important conversation too. Can you just uh, describe the Surveillance Act, who's proposed it? And Sure. Uh, so it, it was introduced uh, last week, if my, my grasp of the passage of time is not too far off, um, by uh, Representatives uh, Anna Eshoo, uh Schakowsky, and, uh, and also introduced in the Senate by uh, Senator Cory Booker. And uh, what it would do is, uh, is prohibit most forms of, uh, of uh, surveillance advertising, which is not to be confused with online advertising, right? There are lots of ways to advertise online and for companies to make lots of money hosting online advertising without violating user privacy, right? And to me, that's really the heart of it is that this entire edifice is built on massive violations of, user, of users' rights. And you can't, you can't build an economy on human rights violations, right? The United States of all countries should know that, right? Um, and I think the, 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 the guiding star in policymaking in this area should first be, let's think about how we protect people's rights, 
And then, you know, we draw the lines and say, no, you cannot collect this data, this type of data under these circumstances. No, you cannot use this data to discriminate against people in ways that are illegal, et cetera, et cetera. And then based on that, the private sector can innovate and figure out how to make, make money. I have every faith in, in the American uh, entrepreneurial spirit. And, and, you know, there are plenty of companies, DuckDuckGo, Reddit, there are lots of others that, that make money based on contextual uh, advertising. Um, and there's, there's no reason why, uh, why we can't, um, you know, have a, a managed shift, right? I mean, I, I agree, you can't just pull something, you can't pull the plug on an entire sector of the economy overnight and expect things to go, to go well. Um, but you know, a managed shift from uh, from the current uh, status quo to uh, to a rights respecting online advertising uh, market, I think, is is really what we need to be looking at. Chris, do you wanna? Yeah, let me weave in a little bit of of Sean's points and and put up um, one note of uh, respectful disagreement with how how Natalie framed her intervention. I uh, I think it's unclear to me how best to articulate what privacy as a right means, particularly given the contextual variances from country to country, from individual to individual, culture to culture within country. It's one of the reasons why when I think of the right of privacy, I do translate it into a choice rather than into more of a technical limitation on what kinds of data can be collected and what can't. That said, I very much appreciate that the conversation about privacy has evolved to the point where we have said, yes, that paradigm on which Silicon Valley was built, the culture of collect it all, store it all forever and monetize it later, that is not acceptable anymore. Now we have moved into a world where we have, I think, mostly globally accepted normatively that we need to limit data collection to, to specific and disclosed purposes and limit secondary use of data once it has been disclosed um, to so, so that you don't use data except for the purpose for which it was collected. I think those principles are good principles, data minimization and, and limiting secondary use. Those don't stop surveillance advertising either, <laughs> right? That is a, it's a little bit of an orthogonal question. And, and so the question is, you know, do we believe there is a universal conception of privacy so robust that it says there can be no surveillance advertising? This is where a lot of people have honest disagreements. I say no, some people say yes, I respect that. Um, but that I think is a lot of what, what we get into this sort of what is the future of the internet, which we haven't agreed on. And then what is the path to get there, which we also haven't agreed on. But that's not going to keep us from starting to go a little bit down the path as we continue talking about this. Up. Yeah, sorry, Susan. I I really want I just want to jump in on that because it's such a great tee up. You know, I think that um, as someone who's tried to run like run a business with a footprint as, as I think everybody here has in something like two hundred countries, there's not an agreed upon conception of privacy. And the, you know, the the things that we're talking about in terms in terms of protecting people's rights are incredibly important, but they are directly at odds in many, many circumstances. And so a lot of what we're essentially talking about is how do you architect systems that are sufficiently devolved or sufficiently federated to be able to exist in political context, but but retain a kind of baseline technical function or set a baseline set of technical expectations that can kind of abide those different political contexts. And I think in a lot of ways, you know, even it's important to say that, that um, you know, we have, a, we have a, a big distance between what is currently regulated and what we believe I think, or what are sort of ultimately rights affecting behaviors. And, you know, a great example of, the values that Chris described in terms of data minimization, no secondary use, is the International, Red, International Committee for the Red Cross. And they you know, run an incredibly vital service where they reconnect families, full, you know, full disclosure, conflict of interest, my wife works there. But uh, you know, at the same time, they were hacked, right? Well, not, there was a breach of their systems. And that breach has a material effect or a material potential effect on the well-being of a number of very vulnerable populations. And so I, I just want to kind of divest us from this idea that we're going to get to a place where technical standards ultimately provide for contextual protection or or and I and I think that you know obviously it's a little bit of a bait and switch given that this is a panel focused on advertising and surveillance advertising. But I think there's a real um, tension in the way that we design progress in this community between expert led and sort of consulting and, and you know, folks, folks essentially kind of like us who, who speak to the policy nature of this, 
versus creating the mechanisms that would let users or let collectives of users express express their preferences in context. And you know, to, to Chris's point, it's not really surveillance advertising, but if you think of fraud detection from your bank, there, you know, there's a lot of value to that service for a lot of people. And, and it is also really based on a, on a certain amount of surveillance of your buying habits. And somewhere in that spectrum, right, we're talking about what should be allowable, but we're also talking about who get, you know, at what stage and for how many people who gets to say, you know, what allowable looks like. And I think that defining those pieces around realizing a set of rights as much as, or, def, you know, as opposed to kind of defending a, a specific set of business practices does a lot to shape kind of what this governance conversation looks like in practice. Thank you for that really important point. The other thing is, you know, I think we often frame this in terms of privacy, but, you know, as the special rapporteur pointed out, that has real consequences for people's freedom of association and expression online. And to the framing in terms of privacy, I find um, disturbing. But then, as you pointed out, Sean, about the normative nature of this, this balance differs in all countries, although I, you know, I do believe they're all there. Okay, time for, for questions. We've got some great ones. So let's start with one for Sean, which is uh, from X of Oxford University, a brilliant scholar. And she wants to know, could you speak a bit more about the question of jurisdiction? <laughs> yes. Uh, I will save everybody speaking at the, my general default enthusiasm level for this topic um, and say that there's a, a, a small paper um, called that I wrote a while ago called Impact Orienting Strategic Litigation or Digital Rights Strategic Litigation. Something like that. Anyway, which is a, a better discussion of this, but essentially um, in response to competing political pressures, different governments, different, different compliance requirements, companies are having to make decisions about how they, how they carry the cost of managing multiple systems and the cost of keeping them connected. And so in doing so, they are deciding whose authority to listen to and whose authority not to listen to. A lot of that usually has to do with either the investments that that company has in that country. For example, the United States benefits from having the staff of and corporate headquarters of a lot of, you know, several main companies, you know, as, as do several other countries that are very influential, as well as things like market size, right? So if you can, if you can lock a company out of a market very often, you have, they are more likely to listen to you. Sometimes though, that can lead to a limitation of the kinds of authority a government has. So we've seen the, the European Union, for example, assess extremely large fines that companies have been broadly willing to pay because they would represent a relatively small amount of their total operating expense or their revenue from that market. Whereas if you try and change a company's behavior, the cost of that of implementing that, let alone implementing that in context versus globally, may mean that they listen to your authority and may mean that they don't. And so a, a great example of that is that there's a, there was a committee of 14 governments that got together that were trying to get, I think, Mark Zuckerberg to appear, you know, to talk about misinformation and disinformation. And their combined population was something like, you know, over a billion people and no, no luck. You know, he did, didn't show up because for whatever reason, they didn't believe that, the, you know, it was an appropriate use of leverage. So it's this idea that there is this very political dimension, this very sort of not just rights exist in, 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 in the abstract, but that rights are the product of an enforcing institution and that the way that we go about seeking and enforcing rights is subject to the political economy of that institution. Okay, another question. Thank you so much. Um, could you comment on the views of the capacity of governments to effectively regulate, legislate? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? Chris, let's start with you. I was going to say, I feel like this one's teed up for me. Um, <laughs> I have really mixed feelings about this question, and it, it also dovetails with Sean's jurisdiction question as well. I think there's a good argument to be made that uh, the traditional, I would, I, I, I'm, I'm overly simplifying, forgive me, 
but a traditional government paradigm of passive rule that expects a certain level of corporate behavior and then enforce violations where that behavior is not bad. I just don't think that works very well in tech categorically. I think we've seen that, frankly, with the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, the landmark privacy law passed by the European Union. I think it got a lot of the norms right, if not all of them, and really went a long way to improving things in practice and to establishing these principles that you collect what you need and that you limit uh, other uses of and so forth. I think enforcing it has been a nightmare. I think it's been difficult for the enforcement agencies who are overtaxed and not appreciated. It's been dis dissatisfying for companies who face these very uh, specific and challenging regulations and don't know exactly what they need to do, especially smaller companies. It's been dissatisfying for privacy advocates who are not seeing the kind of change from the GDPR that frankly they were promised in the political buildup to it. I really think we need to take a step back and think about what a better model for government enforcement looks like here. Now that doesn't mean that it, we shouldn't have government acting, right? As a way of using its power and its influence to continue to develop norms, to continue to push for improvements to the status quo. But like long-term stable government authority, I don't know that we know what the best version of that looks like yet in the context of privacy. I've been pushing on this a lot, not in the privacy context, but in the context of, uh, in the US Section 230, in the EU, the Digital Services Act, Platform Responsibility and Accountability as intermediaries for user content. So I have a, a, a phrase here that I use a lot called the critical community, where I emphasize the practical benefits that come for private sector behavior from leverage by people like Natalie and Sean, right? People sitting outside these companies, helping them see around inherent institutional myopia and calling attention to bad things as they happen in real time. And I really want to lean in more on what government can do effectively to, to empower these forces to be effective checks and really looking to work with non-governmental bodies, not just in how we develop and think about policy, but in how we enforce it and in how we implement it going forward. I think we need a really different way of looking at this. Natalie? You want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, on the whole, I, I agree with Chris that there is more capacity for uh, for the normative conceptual legislating than uh, than for enforcement. Um, but to me, that means that that's the next battle, right? Um, and I think, well, no, I don't think I, I, I know that for uh, 40 years now, especially in the US, we've been uh, fed a bunch of uh, lies about that government is incapable of doing anything good and anything useful, and that therefore we shouldn't even try to use government to do things that are good and useful. And if we start from that with that attitude, then no, government's not going to do anything good or useful because we're not even going to try to use government for that purpose. So I think uh, I think it's important to start from a place of optimism um, and pragmatism and say, okay, well this isn't working yet let's go back to the table and figure out what to tinker with to make it happen. Sean, you want to add anything to that question? No, there's so many good questions. Let's, I, I'd love to, to see if we can okay. get a little more. Okay. Um, so could you please comment on the potential for info mediaries, data fiduciaries, data cooperatives, as a ways to shift, boy, there's a lot in this question, to shift power and flexible control to users enable their agents to negotiate with business on what personal information can be used and how and when. Okay, so Sean, why don't we start with you on that? Sure thing. Uh, so I have logged a couple of hours in this simulator. And so I, I do believe um, that there's a lot of value to building out infrastructure that does a better job of modeling decisions about data and rights in context and that it's important to give character and articulation to those things. And so I think that the governance mechanisms that you're describing are things that do have a lot of potential, but I would say, and sort of drawing on one of the other questions in the chat, so much of the, the let's say, um, material generated about the topic at this point is essentially motivated and funded by an effort to, to train AI models or to legitimize AI models. And so to generate you know, a kind of checkbox enough architecture to create these frictionless funnels around large pools of data. I think that practice is inherently problematic 
Uh, and so, you know, running it through a new type of organizational infrastructure doesn't particularly launder it more effectively or legitimize it in, in a way that I think is inherent, right? All of the things that are used as specific nouns in that question are instruments. And those instruments are only as effective as the intention and the implementation that kind of lives around them. And so, you know, uh, I, I think they are really valuable and it's, it's very, they're, they're, they are an important part of our overall legal infrastructure. And the way that you know this is that essentially in every modern society, in pretty much every society, we have a recognition that public systems or publicly influential systems also impact the rights of those who are not able to represent themselves in front of those systems. That might be because of their children, that might be because they're elderly or disabled or any number of other conditions, unconscious. And so when people build those systems, we have, as you know, that's what fiduciary infrastructure is. It's essentially designed to create loyal representation inside of systems. So there's a model for it, and it's a very natural model to carry forward into the digital world where we can establish high integrity ecosystems in which to do it. But I do, I do really caution against this idea that as an instrumentation, they will inherently fix some of the real important behavior issues. Anyone else? Yeah, if I could build on that a little bit, and, and, and I, um, I've, I've uh, read a fair bit and know the author of this comment, so I have maybe more familiarity with its motivations than most. Um, I agree with Sean's point entirely that that uh, it there is no techno solutionism magic answer to any of these problems, and that just adding another layer to Natalie's chart from the beginning, where we have a separate function, doesn't solve the problem. However, I think it's a step forward to think about disaggregating the functions. Sean was saying this too. This is not a note of disagreement. I'm just putting some more more words into the same line of thought disaggregating these functions a bit, and particularly if we're able to do it in a way that, to my earlier point, puts market forces to work. So to me, one of the secret sauces of the internet is that for a very, very long time, still in many places, this is true, but not in all of them, the cost of market entry is near zero. So like what it takes to create a new business and to reach users and to do something really cool is so low within the internet ecosystem. It's less and less true when you start to look at the advertising based social critical mass need to get to bootstrap to get a few million users before you're even relevant. If something like this intermediaries as a concept lowers the cost of market entry for different pieces of this by saying you as a new business don't need to build as many things or gain as many users or gain as many resources to really be relevant in the market. I think there's an opportunity there to bring market forces back into this and to create more effective options and choice aligned with everything that I've been saying today. Can I, yeah. sorry, I, I, Natalie, I'm sure you have something smarter to say, but if I could just really quickly, while, while the iron is hot with what Chris just said, Two of the really important problems that have come up, the duty articulation, essentially, you know, Chris mentioned earlier that we have this problem where we like put everything out into the world and then kind of whack-a-mole the problems that come up until they reach a critical mass and are forced to change. And one of the things that the creation of trusts and information fiduciary relationships do is articulate duties and articulate purpose and narrow in a narrow enough setting that they can be enforceable. And then I think. You know, the other thing to say really quickly is that a fiduciary relationship is a fundamentally representative relationship. In other words, you don't exchange commodities about a person in a, in a fiduciary relationship about them. When you exchange information about a person in a fiduciary relationship, you're making a factual assertion that's intended to do something for that person. It's intended to get them access to a benefit, a care, you know, health care, a legal representation. All of those things are in, in inherently contextual, but also rely on the substance of what it's, is, is being said, as well as the fact that it is sort of an information exchange in character. And both of those, I think, are important layers that, that add productive governance friction into constructive you know, market environments. Yeah, I'll be very brief. Um, Richard and I have, have engaged on this topic before, and uh, I, uh, I, I wrote most of what I have to say on this topic on a, in a paper that came out last year. Um, but basically, I'm, I'm, I'm very skeptical, um, especially as I think this, this just creates more governance problems than, than it actually solves, right? Um, but since I published that, that article, uh, some colleagues in Europe uh, have convinced me that in a context where you already have 
uh, baseline privacy regulations and baseline uh, enforcement um, and so on, that in those cases, um, inter inter um, interoperability, which is not quite the same thing as, uh, as the infomediaries construct, that some degree of inter uh, interoperability between platforms uh, would have a number of positive effects. Um, it's not an area that I'm really uh, an expert in, so it's something I'm still learning about. Um, but as far as infomediaries themselves, you know, the idea of using a, some combination of techno solutionism and market, market forces to solve these problems, I just don't see it at all. Thank you for those responses. So we have a bunch of other questions. And one question is, would a centralized regulatory system administered through a monolithic government structure ever be able to stay ahead of the curve? And, um, you know, what about Web 0.3? Does anyone want to? comment on that as a alternative to the current power structure? Is that question too hard to answer right now since no one knows what Web.3 is? Anyone want to I'll, take that? I'll, I'll go briefly. Um, I, I, I feel like I've already made my voice clear on the centralized government monolithic enforcement that we need to, to improve on that. I do, I do uh, share Natalie's <laughs> optimism, I would argue, that there is a constructive and positive role for government in this space. And when we think about it in the right way, so so I want to continue to lean in on that, and on how do we how do we make government work well to to get to better outcomes here. Um, I uh, appreciate some of the opportunities for some of the technology folded within the Web three blockchain movement, distributed transaction ledgers, and so forth. By the way, I'm a former computer scientist. There are opportunities for this kind of decentralized proving that a thing has happened. The level of optimism around Web three. I, I think is vastly exaggerated. And, and I'll point folk to a newsletter called Untangled. It's a Substack by Charlie Johnson of Data and Society for which the first purpose, uh, the first post made clear the difference between decentralized technology and decentralized power. And so long as you have centralized power, nothing is going to be any better as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I'll, I'll add something to that, which is that there are an awful lot of people uh, who have either been directly involved in or have benefited, benefited from all the screw ups that have gotten us to where we are today, who have a vested interest in making sure that we don't actually fix the mess that they created for us and that instead uh, would like to start a whole new conversation and a whole new paradigm um, where they'll be free to uh, innovate and do whatever they want and repeat the same mistakes. Uh, there are a couple different um, brands on this web three is one of them um the metaverse is another one of them i'm not interested in any of those conversations i'm interested in fixing the world that we actually live in today i am also interested in fixing the world we live in today just i think i hope i think that's a, a theme we can all seize on i i am a little bit i'll be honest with you I'm a little bit exhausted by the false binary in like centralized and decentralized systems. It's literally not how anything works, anything. There's nothing that is inherently functionally specifically so centralized that it can actually be called centralized, which is why supply chain attacks are so effective and so prevalent. It's also why hosting and DDoS effects have taken out entire chunks of the internet for, you know, Large, relatively large periods of time. So I, from, from a, just a nomenclature perspective, I think, you know, the progress is in, is in figuring out the interconnections between layers of devolved authority. So recognizing that we have interdependence, both technically, socially, financially, you know, socio-normatively, and trying to get to negotiated layers where that happens. I just, I won't belabor the point on Web3. It sounds like people have kind of got gotten all the way through that. I just think that it's not particularly new as someone who was like building, you know, downloadable decentralized offline systems in 2005. Like I look at what we're talking about now and it's just basically about whether or not you, uh, you know, technology owners either force themselves as intermediaries to an extent as is happening with a number of web three technologies at the moment. So you just have another round of gatekeepers as Moxie Marlin Spike, I think did a, a decent, you know, pretty good job of, of demonstrating. Or you're just talking about, you know, if, if you're a technology builder, maybe you don't have to make all of the decisions for a user and you can design for your tool set to be, you know, to promote their agency and their own work uh, in ways that don't necessarily have to layer in your interests. And so I think both of those are critiques of, of Web3 that I think are probably gonna grow over time. 
Okay, uh, we have two questions that, that attempt to quantify this. So one asks, well, you know, and, uh, can you give us some information on dollar amounts? What are the kind of dollar amounts that we're talking about related to privacy? I'm not sure I understand that question, but maybe you guys do. The other one um, looks to, could you just delineate the direct harms of customer surveillance that users need to be most concerned about? I can take that second question. Uh, the first one, I don't know that any of us here have the, mic, you know, the econometrics chops to, to even try to, to answer it. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. We all contain multitudes. Um, as far as harms, that's that, you know, it's really hard to uh, to generalize. You know, there's a there's a concept in in digital security um, of um, um, threat modeling, where in a given for a given individual in a given situation, you think very concretely and specifically about the different threats and, and different harms um, that there might be. So I really can't give an answer that's going to be true across the board, uh, but I can give you a few examples. Um, so if I'm uh, if I'm a gay teenager in uh, with a very conservative family, um, my biggest threat is probably that um, you know I'm going to go to a website. I want to visit websites that talk about uh, sexual health, including uh, sexual health for gay youth. I might uh, watch some it gets it gets better uh, videos on YouTube. I might participate in a um, uh, I don't know, an online forum, a support group type of thing. And the uh, the surveillance advertising uh, ecosystem identifies me as being interested in LGBT topics and starts showing uh, LGBT related ads on my family computer or, um, you know, in some other way outs me to my parents, right? That that would be the, the concern in that situation. Um, another example might be uh, if, um, you know, if I'm a if I'm a black voter in uh, in a swing state, uh, I might be subjected to a lot of uh, targeted uh, ads uh, discouraging me to vote, uh, spreading dis misinformation about um, you know my local um, my local black elected representative, uh, trying to say that you know I'm not even going to speculate what nonsense, but basically trying to suppress my vote or telling me that uh, that the election is on Wednesday when it's actually on Tuesday, uh, that you can vote by SMS and so on. These are all things that have happened in the in the past few elections in the U.S. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that, but the, the point is that it's very individual and very, uh, very, very specific. Anyone else want to comment? I, really quickly, I, this is a weird thing to say on this panel, but I find surveillance as a term to be so distracting. It's like corruption is a term. It means a million different crimes, but really what it means is enabling a million different crimes. And to me, the, like the focusing on surveillance as a behavior is because we are not, we don't have the tools to enforce the crime, you know, our rights in the actions that take place. So not to like, it's, I think that there are a lot of harms, but a lot of them are the ones that Natalie's saying you get e either targeted or false representation uh, are, are big things. And then also sometimes people will, will impersonate important aspects of your life or people in your life to take advantage of you. But they're, you know, everything from political acts, like Natalie's saying, to personal things to, you know, uh, crime, just, just a lot of crime. Fraud. If I could build on that, and I'll try to weave in some of that first question as well, I think it's really nice to tease apart the pieces associated with that very daunting frame of surveillance that are so rights oriented. And one of the ways in which we can make some constructive progress against things like dark patterns, things like sensitive categories, things that have sort of less economic first and more sort of human first kind of consequences. And I think there's a real like unanimity we can build in that direction. It's separate a bit from the money questions, from the business model choice questions, which is why I keep coming back to that idea of like a choice of business models. So yeah, uh, you get a free service and you have targeted advertising directed to you. You kind of lose perspective on that over time, right? You just kind of assume that Facebook and Gmail will be free and you forget about the fact that like you're actually getting a service here. Now that trade-off, I'm not saying it's fair. Like I'm not saying, you know, that things should be the way that they are, but I'm saying that I think sometimes we need to sort of look at the experiments that are happening in the market and gain some perspective on it. So search, for example, we're seeing Neva uh, build up as a competitor to search and they're building it as a paid service model. I don't know how successful it will be. I'm glad somebody's trying it, right? I'm not saying that the existence of one paid search competitor constitutes a competitive market. This isn't a competition conversation. I'm just saying that like, 
it's important to think about these things separately. The like the rights perspective, human safety and interest pieces of the surveillance system that we have versus the economic perspective where people need to be given choices and given agency and empowerment within a market to choose the service and the option that is best for them. You know, as I listen to you, I have to say, I think there's something more, which is, it seems to me inherently dangerous for democracy and autonomy to have companies uh, be so opaque about the large troves of personal data that they have. Just today, Avril Haynes was talking about the large troves of personal data held by US government agencies and the classification of it. And I, I just think there's something inherently wrong if for democratic states to not, I don't wanna say police it, but govern it in some way. Because um, it used to be only governments that had that much information about that many people. Uh, Sounds like the topic of our next webinar, Susan. <laughs> Actually, thank you for that introduction. Our next speaker will be Bernd Lange, member of the EU Parliament, who will talk about DSA and DMA um, and digital trade from a European parliamentarian perspective, and that'll be February 15th. But um, we welcome that idea and any other ideas anybody else has, please let us know because we want your feedback on these webinars. And let me thank these speakers for taking so much of their time. Sean, Chris, Natalie, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and everybody have a great day. We've exceeded our time. So thank you so much. Have a good one. Thanks all. Bye.